Everybody die. That's what he said. Everybody's going to die. That's what he said. Roseanne Solis was in the church when the gunman, Devin Kelly, blasted his way inside. He was going through the aisles all around with his, hunt, with his it wasn't a handgun, it was a pistol or a, uh, he was looking all around and shooting at everybody, just going through the rows, shooting at everybody. The guy was still shooting. He was shooting, I mean, I think he shot more than 300 shots. So then he, uh, he it stopped for about, I would say like five minutes. And then I guess he must have reloaded and started again. All these people screaming and bleeding and nobody, nobody would get there to save us from, the, you know, from the shooter. The bullets were coming right down. I could see it on the carpet. The bullets hitting, passing me like that, you know, and I could see it on the carpet. I said, if I don't move from here, I'm going to die. As the FBI continues to comb the church property, investigators say the mass shooting stemmed from a domestic incident. Hello, everyone. I'm Yuki Washington. I'm Jessica Dean. Here's what else we now know from Sutherland Springs. 26 people are dead, 20 others injured. The shooter, Devin Patrick Kelly, threatened his ex-mother-in-law in a text message on the day of that shooting. And he shot and killed his ex-wife's grandmother in that rampage. FBI agents use metal detectors to comb through the murder scene outside the First Baptist Church of Sutherland Springs, Texas. Authorities say 26-year-old Devin Kelly opened fire during services Sunday, killing more than two dozen people. There are a lot of questions about how this mass murderer continued to slip through the system time and time again. how this mass murderer continued to slip through the system time and time again. He was repeatedly under investigation from everything from sex assaults to sneaking weapons onto a military base. There were major failures. There were major failures that allowed this violent man to buy weapons that he ultimately used at least one of them to kill half of a congregation. We're now learning from a police report that the gunman had escaped a mental facility in 2012 after trying to smuggle weapons onto an Air Force base and making death threats against his military superiors. Documents show he pleaded guilty to striking, choking, kicking, and pulling the hair of his then wife on two separate occasions. Yet none of this was reported as required by federal law to the FBI, which would have prohibited Kelly from buying weapons, including the weapon that authorities say he used to kill more than two dozen people at First Baptist Church in Sutherland Springs. A source told News 8 that the military is notorious for not reporting criminal history to the FBI. In addition to all of that, Kelly was also under investigation by the Camel County Sheriff's Office in June 2013 for reported sexual assault, but the case was stalled and nothing more was done. We're re still researching it. We, we think that it was partly because maybe the suspect had uh, moved to Colorado. So again, he slipped through the system. The Pentagon recently did a study to show, to see how, um, how many cases the FBI has failed, uh, to, well, rather the military has failed to report to the FBI, and they found that there were hundreds of cases that the military has not reported to the FBI, and now there is a big investigation into all branches of the military to determine just how big of a problem this is and how they can stop this from happening again. Law enforcement sources tell ABC News Aaron Alexis abruptly left a Newport, Rhode Island Navy barracks after constantly complaining that noises were coming out of his linen closet. During roughly the same time frame, Newport Naval Station police were warned by local authorities that Alexis was hearing voices and feared he was under constant surveillance by shadowy figures. September 1st, Aaron Alexis sends Timothy White and other FCHS members this email. My name is Aaron. I am ex-Navy and have been working as a contractor for the DOD. I have recently come under attack after blowing up at Norfolk Airport. Alexis goes on to write that I am glad I found this site. 
However, I need assistance because I have not allowed them to scare me off my job. But I fear constant bombardment from the ELF weapon is starting to take its toll on my body. I think I know the specific group in the military that is responsible for developing and assisting the military with. Aaron Alexis, armed with a shotgun, kills 12 people and wounds three others at the headquarters of Naval Sea Systems Command in Washington, D.C. He said he was hearing voices. Um, he was detached from reality at certain points. Investigators say when Alexis entered the building, he went to a fourth floor atrium and started shooting people who were having coffee and breakfast below, firing on them with a shotgun. On the barrel was etched the phrase, my elf weapon. On October 14th, I was contacted by Timothy White. He wanted to talk about the Alexis emails. The day when Aaron Alexis took those people's lives, what was your reaction, Timothy? It's another one. <laughs> Could you say it's, an, it's sad, but it's another tragic case of, of a person that's possibly a victim and manipulating into shooting other people. Pretty unbelievable. Uh, that anyone could carry this out. And then we're learning that he goes on and picks people up, Uber customers, in the middle of all this. This suspect was an Uber driver and, yes, in fact, was picking up fares in between his shooting spree. As a matter of fact, uh, when he was eventually captured about 12.30 a.m. last night, he was still actively working, still picking up fares when he was taken into custody. This as we're hearing new 911 calls from the shooting scene. One car is okay. The other one is a minivan and the passenger is not moving. Dalton is accused of killing six people that night three weeks ago. A surviving 14-year-old girl, Abigail Koff, now seen smiling with her sister at the hospital. Police now revealing new details. After his arrest, the 45-year-old allegedly telling them that Uber literally took over his mind and body and that the app made him feel like a puppet. Dalton allegedly describing the Uber logo as a devil figure, saying it was almost like artificial intelligence that can tap into your body. Right So, Ms. Crothers, are you okay? Or do we need to take a minute? Workers were discussing killing me, taking to the KKK, and on a CD, one of my co workers is discussing a list that I've been placed on. And once you get placed on this list, all the money in the world won't save me. If they want me, I'm gone. That's on a CD. I also overheard my co worker recruiting for this group, and he stated, Man, you got to get in this thing. This thing is bigger than the KKK. There's judges in it policemen in it, attorneys in it, doctors in it, everybody's in this thing. Then he went on to say that his uncle's in it, and his uncle was a big time official here in Louisville, Kentucky. A frightening scene at the height of the government shutdown. Gunfire just outside the Capitol building. How Shot. rapid were the shots? Quite rapid. It was it was like boom, 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 boom. Huh? It, was, it was like 
Boom, 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 boom. Uh, I was walking towards the Capitol building, um, and about 30 seconds later, as I hit this point, uh, there was about three or four cop cars that sped past me. About how many shots? Five or six, but there must have been some before. Uh -huh. I don't know, it's scary. Now at 5, ABC7 brings you live, complete coverage. She had postpartum depression after having the baby, her mother said. A few months later, she got sick. She was depressed. She was hospitalized. ABC News has learned Carrie had an encounter with Stanford, Connecticut police in December where she claimed she was under electronic surveillance by President Obama. The boyfriend had called police saying that she was delusional, that she thought President Obama was uh, surveilling her electronically, uh, and whether this is why she decided to go down to Washington, to the White House, all of that under investigation right now. Think about it. She actually packed a bag, strapped her daughter in that car, and then drove hundreds of miles down to the White House. White House, possibly to get an audience with the president, Jake. But Jill Kanopka is live in Stanford right now with more on what she was able to learn about this woman. Jill? The young child with her in the vehicle, who is not believed to be harmed, was taken to the hospital. There was a second person that was inside that black infinity with that woman. That person, we are being told, is now in police custody. The attack came without warning, as seen on this airport surveillance video obtained by TMZ. Coming into view from the left, 26-year-old Esteban Santiago pulls out his pistol and opens fire. Passengers run for cover as Santiago moves out of camera range through the baggage claim section, where police say he emptied his 9mm semi-automatic handgun and then reloaded once. He killed five people, many of them arriving for a cruise ship vacation. And now the question is why Santiago even had a gun, which had been taken away last November when he showed up at the FBI office in Alaska to claim he was hearing voices about ISIS. Brian Santiago says his brother had mental health issues and was not well since he returned from the Iraq war. Here now, watch what this suspected killer's brother told CNN today. Take a listen. I want to clarify this for the Puerto Rican people and for all the people in the world, that the federal government already knew his reaction. They already knew the thoughts that he was having and how they weren't good. He himself went after them to ask for help, and they did nothing. They had him hospitalized for four days, and then they let him go. How are you going to let someone leave a psychological center after four days when he is saying that he's hearing voices, that the CIA is telling him to join certain groups? This was in November. Overnight, a former girlfriend, Michelle Quinones, told ABC News that Santiago returned from deployment to Iraq deeply troubled after saying he saw two of his National Guard buddies killed in action but could not get help from the Veterans Administration. He started acting weird when he was in Puerto Rico and he had let veterans know that he was having some mental problems, that he wasn't feeling all right, and they did nothing. Santiago had no problem legally checking his gun as airplane baggage. He arrived at 12.11 Friday afternoon and began his murderous rampage just 44 minutes later. Tonight, the burning question in this close-knit military community shattered again by a mass shooting. Who was the man behind these pictures? Ivan Lopez dressed in his uniform, and here he is smiling in photos posted on Facebook, his children by his side, a father of three, a husband, a soldier. But something inside snapped. Lopez was a 34-year-old Army specialist with a clean record. He served four months in Iraq in 2011. The Pentagon says he never saw combat. But authorities say what he created here was a horror of its own. Shortly after 4 p.m. yesterday, he opens fire on the base. 416, the first wounded soldiers call 911. Center, all units have survived. We have an active shooter currently on Fort Hood. Then he gets into his vehicle and keeps firing. So we have multiple gunshot victims. He then walks into a second building, opening fire again. The alert goes out. <laughs> In fact, neighbors were with his wife yesterday when news crossed of the shootings. At first, she was worried for her husband's safety. She was crying. So I just, you know, I just consoled her. You know, I told everything would be okay. And, you know, we all came downstairs and, you know, we sat there. And as soon as they announced the name of the shooter, she, she just lost it. Um, and and what, did she, what did she say to you and, and what did you say to her? Uh, she said, that's him, that's him. And I, I didn't really say anything to her because what could I say? Here's what we do know. 
He purchased a 45 caliber handgun from Guns Galore March 1st, a little more than a month ago. The same gun store near Fort Hood where Major Nadal Hassan bought his gun in 2009 before killing 13 and injuring more than 30 here. And while authorities here at Fort Hood were aware Lopez suffered from mental issues, seeing a psychiatrist last month, today in Washington, the Secretary of the Army said there were no warning signs of anything like this. As of this morning, we had no uh, indication on the record of that examination that there was any sign of, of uh, likely violence, either to himself or to others. Today, my colleague Martha Raddatz spoke to Lopez's former supervisor in Puerto Rico, who was full of nothing but praise. So you would say he was an outstanding soldier? That's correct. He was an outstanding and disciplined soldier. He started acting weird when he was in Puerto Rico, and he had let veterans know that he was having some mental problems, that he wasn't feeling all right, and they did nothing. Today, my colleague Martha Raddatz spoke to Lopez's former supervisor in Puerto Rico, who was full of nothing but praise. So you would say he was an outstanding soldier? That's correct. He was an outstanding and disciplined soldier. But it was last summer when things began to unravel. He was uh, undergoing uh, a variety of treatment and diagnoses for mental health conditions, ranging from depression to anxiety. Uh, to some sleep disturbance. He was prescribed a number of, uh, of drugs to address those, uh, including Ambien. Lopez was being tracked for signs of post-traumatic stress. It's not a, I see you for the first time and you have post-traumatic stress disorder. Now normally post-traumatic stress is not a diagnosis that you make on, on one appointment. It's, an appoint, it's something that you make over a series of appointments. And this afternoon, new clues into his mental state as authorities continue their investigation. We have uh, very strong evidence that he had a uh, medical history uh, that indicates uh, unstable psychiatric or psychological condition. Uh, going through all the records to ensure that uh, uh, that is in fact correct, but we believe that to be uh, the fundamental underlying causal fact. We have breaking news right now. Our continuing coverage of the library shooting on the campus of Florida State University. Three people shot early this morning. The gunman shot and killed by police now identified. Tallahassee police are updating the investigation right now. So let's listen in. All right, you've been listening to the Tallahassee police and the president of F FSU recapping what happened at the shooting at Florida State University at 12.30 a.m. overnight. The suspect, identified as Myron May, opened fire inside the Stozier Library, shot three people. And they're really uncovering now maybe what the motive is, saying that in their investigation, they've learned so far that Myron Ray had documents that he was somehow afraid of being targeted, possibly by the government. It's really unfortunate that I have to make this video. See, I am a victim of covert harassment uh, and electronic harassment and gang stalking. Uh, I'm what's called a targeted individual. On November 20th, 2014, 31-year-old Myron May walks into Strozier Library on the campus of Florida State University and opens fire. Three people are injured. May tries to leave campus and a shootout with police in front of the library ends violently. The medical examiner confirming May was shot 24 times by police. For now, things seem to be back to normal on campus. Students have fallen back into their routines, but it was here not so long ago on a tragic night that has many wondering what could make a man snap and lose control. 
Have you ever been driving along the highway and noticed a rather odd-looking tree sticking up above the rest? What kind of tree do you think that is? It's a pine tree. It's a pine tree? It looks like it anyway. It's not a tree. What do you think it is? I think it's disguised as a tree. What you're looking at is actually a cell phone tower. Many communities have decided that this is easier on the eyes than one of these. No one really wants that visual pollution. There are certain cities that now have required all the new towers that are being built to be disguised. Andrew Messing is the president of Larson Camouflage, a company that builds cell phone towers in a wide variety of disguises, from palm trees to water towers to flagpoles. This is one of our saguaro cacti that's going up to the Phoenix area, and the antennas are concealed inside. They're extremely realistic. People drive by them all the time, and they think they're real cacti. of technology is popping up on city blocks and in neighborhoods around central Indiana and you might be wondering what are they? Well these poles have been going up in the Indies downtown area and in some suburbs. We found out these are called microsites. These smaller cell towers can provide cell phone coverage along with data coverage inside buildings or in areas where there are a large number of people using smartphones at once. Think Lucas Oil Stadium or the track or the Indiana Convention Center. We've learned that these smaller towers are popping up in residential areas that had bad cell service. Carriers like Verizon and AT&T run fiber to these sites. Once online, they become a fully functioning cell tower. Okay. Four-year-old Charlotte Holmgren has a bedroom view that nearly everyone in Little Silver, New Jersey is talking about. Do you know what that is? Tower. This cell tower is just 120 feet from her home. I'm scared to death that she's going to wake up with cancer or reproductive issues. Charlotte's mother, Alicia Holmgren, says the 95-foot structure was built within a week in May, smack in the middle of town with seemingly no warning to residents. There were no official letters that went out notifying us of what was going on. It just appeared. We reached out to Little Silver Mayor Robert Neff to find out why residents weren't directly notified about the tower construction, but he never responded to our request for comment. I literally found out about it driving through town one day and I saw it in the field and I was like, Ex wait, excuse me, what just, what is this? While scientific experts recommend cell towers be at least 1,500 feet from schools, this cell tower sits less than 500 feet from Markham Elementary School, the town library and recreational center. The collective concern, unknown health risks. That concerns me as a parent that my children will be someplace that I don't have a control on what they're being exposed to. They could do something about it. I mean, it's not a matter of blaming someone. Um, it's a matter of really trying to find out a reasonable solution. Residents say that they're hoping the hundreds of people expected at a public forum on Monday will be enough to convince town officials to move this tower somewhere else. It's very, very much hard to believe. I've now driven down almost a full block, right next to the telephone pole, down a full block, check this out. I'm going to show you the meter reading and the meter is still up at two and three volts per meter in the red on the left hand side at the peak. You can see it again pumped all the way almost to the top at the top of the reading is six volts per meter down around 0.5 and 0.7 is already starting to get dangerous. For many churches, the wireless problem is a blessing. This Washington congregation receives more than $1,000 a month to allow antennas to operate in their steeple. It's sort of serendipity that we came to have this, and so I think a lot of churches would like to have it. But of all the disguises we've seen, our favorite is this site in Staten Island, a cell phone tower made to look like a lighthouse. And it's so realistic that neighbors say it attracts tourists. They do take photos, have people that do come up, um, they look at it. The only giveaway is that it's miles from the ocean. It's much nicer than what it could be. I mean, wouldn't, would you like that instead of antennas just showing up? Oh, it's beautiful.
Do people in the general population have any reason to fear the members of your organization? I don't have any reason to fear our members of our organization. They, have a re they, have, they now have a reason to fear the public at large because this is everywhere.